to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey god says come let us reason together though your sins be as scarlet I'll make them white as snow, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Welcome to our study of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the great messianic prophecies of the Old Testament in which pictures of restoration, pictures of hope, and yet pictures of doom are given to God's children if they're not willing to change their ways and in the midst of all that. We see the prophecies of Jesus as they begin to unfold and we look at the New Testament to see their fulfillment. The name Isaiah literally means salvation. And this book is a book that pictures the salvation of the restoration movement, the salvation of that group of people who were willing to do what God says and ultimately of those who are in Christ the Messiah. Isaiah began to prophesy somewhere around the year 759. Now that's critical because as we hear these prophecies that Isaiah is going to make, remember that some of these are made at least 750 years before Christ came on the scene and so they were impossible to figure out, to know, to statistically analyze. These are things that without the help of the Holy Spirit and the infinite wisdom and knowledge of God could not have come true. You know, when we think about Isaiah, it's a very unique book. And here are some things that maybe will help in understanding just some basic keys to the book. As we mentioned, Isaiah's name means salvation. And one of the key words in the book is the word salvation. This occurs some 25 times in Isaiah and only seven and all of the other prophetic books combined. And so this book has a great deal to say about salvation. Presently, if they wanted to be saved, if Israel wanted to be restored, they had to follow God's command. Future, through the Messiah, the true salvation of Israel, God's people in the church would come. Key verse, Isaiah 53 and verse 6, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. For our iniquities and through His stripes we can be healed. Critical crux of the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus is seen in Isaiah 53 as it prophesies what He would do for man, how much He would give up, what He would suffer, and how that salvation is available through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A key phrase that we find often in the book of Isaiah is the phrase Holy One. This occurs 33 times and Isaiah not only references God and shows God and His power and wisdom, but He represents God's holiness. God is the Holy One. His people, all the nations are to recognize that and we're to give God the honor and the glory He deserves because He's the true essence of what holiness is all about. Of course, the key chapter to designate in the book of Isaiah begins in Isaiah 52 verse 13 and ends at the close of Isaiah 53 what we call Isaiah chapter 53 the great chapter showing the suffering servant of God none other than Jesus Christ what he gave up what he endured and what he made possible and really one of the critical chapters in the Old Testament. Now, as you think about Isaiah, here's an, a kind of easy way to remember the book. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, are a lot like the 39 books of the Old Testament that represent God's judgment on the nations and His appeal for them to get right 
and the consequences if they don't. There's judgment, there's doom, there's destruction, and there's always a message of hope, and yet mixed with that is the fear of God if they don't get right. And so a lot like the Old Testament, chapters 1 through 39. Then chapters 40 through 66, like the 27 books of the New Testament, represent a different message of, of hope, a restoration found in the Messiah whom we know is Jesus Christ. And so that may be a very easy, very memorable way to break down the book of Isaiah. Now let's turn our attention to some of the more practical and living messages of the book of Isaiah. I want you to notice in Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 18, God's fervent plea to the people of Israel and to all men and women everywhere. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. One of the things that God appeals to in this book is that man can come to God through His grace, through His mercy, through His love, and through the reasoning power of His Word. God's Word has great power as God gives it to mankind. Isaiah says in Isaiah 55 verses 7 through 11 that hit God's Word will not return void. It will accomplish that for which He sent it. Do you remember Hebrews 4, verse 12? The Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so we have the message of the reasoning power of God and God's Word. And God says to man, come, let us reason together. Friend, God is not a God who wants people to be lost. In fact, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. In fact, Peter says in 2 Peter 3 verse 9 that the Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God says to man, come. That's much like what Jesus said in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You see, God sent His Son so that all men could have that salvation. John 3, 16. He wants all men to be saved. All men have the opportunity. But in this approach, it takes both sides. God's done His part in that He's made salvation available. He's made His revelation accessible to all men. And yet man must also take a step to come to God. We've got to be willing to draw near to God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 following. We've got to approach Him and be able to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. And then I want you to notice what happens when man is willing to approach God on his terms. God says, come, let us reason together. And when man listens to God and does what he says, God says, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Here you have the, the picture of the transformation and the cleansing that takes place through the blood of Jesus. If anyone's in Christ, He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All has become new. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. When one obeys the gospel, he hears the word, he believes in Jesus, he's willing to repent of things in his life that he knows are not right, make that good confession just like the Ethiopian eunuch, he gets what Paul got in Acts 22 16. Ananias says, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That which is red and dirty, through the blood of Jesus, is forgiven and cleansed and made white as snow. And so here's a perfect picture of just how much God loves man seen from the outset 
of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Now, another important principle that we see in Isaiah has to deal with the future coming of the house of the Lord. Notice Isaiah chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Well, as we think about this prophecy, we're impressed with its power, we're impressed with God's great plea to all mankind but I want you to think about this phrase, the house of the Lord. During the Old Testament time, God's temple was often referred to as the house of God or the house of the Lord. Solomon told God that he wanted to build a house for his name and that was ultimately accomplished during the reign of Solomon. But as we think about the house of the Lord, it's going to be built. It's something that is future tense. Not the one that Solomon, not another house that's been built. What house is this? My friends, this is the future kingdom and house of God that Paul speaks of. 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul says to Timothy, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. What is this house or temple of God in the New Testament? It's the kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus promised to Peter, I will build my church. He promised that would happen during the lifetime of those men. Jesus said in Mark 9 verse 1, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death, death until they see the kingdom present with power. So Jesus promised to build it. He said His disciples would see it. Did that happen? Acts chapter 2, when men and women cried out, Sirs, or men and women, what must we do to be saved? What shall we do? The answer was, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2 verse 38 and in verse 47 the Bible says, The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. And so as we think about this house of the Lord, we know in the New Testament that represents the church. There was a temple then. What's being spoken of? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now with that in mind, I want you to consider some other things. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that all nations, or excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2, the Bible says that all nations shall flow to it. Now, was that the case with the Jewish temple? The Jewish temple was for the nation of Israel. It was a place where they went to honor God, to, to worship, to offer sacrifice at times, but all nations were not willingly invited and it was not available for all nations. Well, whatever this is, is for all nations. Do you remember the Great Commission? Jesus told His disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Mark chapter 16 verse 15. The great plea in Revelation 22 is, let whosoever will come. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ. Galatians 3 verses 26 through 29. And then we ask the question, where is this temple of the Lord going to begin and start at? I want you to notice Isaiah chapter 2 in verse 3. The Bible says, For out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. If this house of the Lord is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I know a very specific identifying characteristic of the Lord's church. It must have begun 
in Jerusalem by the power of God's Word. Did that happen? You bet it did. In Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, 50 days after the death of Jesus on Pentecost, Peter stands up with the eleven in fulfillment with the promise of Jesus that the Spirit would come on high. They now receive that Spirit. They begin to preach the message of Jesus. Men and women are pricked in their hearts. They for the very first time are told what to do to be saved. Acts 2 verse 38. And my friends, in Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, the Lord started the church. It started there, it began there, its foundation was there, and any religious group that is going to claim to go by the Bible has to find its origin of its church in Acts chapter 2. Of course, we know there is but one body, Ephesians 4 verse 4. We know that body is the church. We know that we're baptized into the one body, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. And thus, it was never God's plan for denominationalism and groups named after men to exist. That was never the will of God. One church. According to Isaiah, was going to start in Jerusalem. That's the kingdom. The Lord is coming back to receive to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 24. Now, let's talk a little bit then about some of the, the moral and ethical teachings that Isaiah tries to get across to the nation of Israel and the heathen nations that are steeped in immorality. I want you to notice Isaiah chapter 5 and what the Bible says in verse number 20. God says to the people of His time, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. God says of these same people in Isaiah 5 verse 13, Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. When we think about some of Israel's problems, they didn't know how to label and what sin was or how to look at it correctly. They called evil good and good evil. They called sweet bitter and bitter sweet. They had it all backward. This is a, a backward type of morality. Friend, in the United States of America, we have some of these same problems today. When we call things that God calls a sin by any other name, we're doing the same thing Israel was. For example, we call today homosexual marriage, which God calls vile, unnatural, and deserving of a penalty, Romans 1, 26 and 27, we call it an alternate lifestyle. We call the murder of unborn children a choice when God calls it sin. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Exodus chapter 21, verse 22. We call the putting to death of those who are aged, euthanizing them, something pleasant, when in reality it's nothing short of murder. And so just like during the days of Isaiah, we have it so backward in so many ways in our world today, and thus there's a real need to go back to the Word of God, back to the Bible, and call sin what it really is. Destructive, deadly, and damning to one's soul. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Isaiah chapter 1, uh, verse 18. And Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 4. Then I want you to think with me for just a moment as we think about practical lessons from Isaiah. One of the problems that existed then and that still exists today is that so many people just want a, a smooth, positive, feel-good message and they never really want to get to the heart of the problem. Notice Isaiah chapter 30 and I want you to look with me in verse number 10. That's Isaiah chapter 30 verse number 10. The scripture records the people saying this, They said to the seer or to the prophet, Do not see and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceit. What in essence are they saying here? To the one who could have a vision from God, they said, don't tell us a vision that will make us feel bad. To the prophet, they said, don't prophesy the truth, tell us lies, tell us smooth things. 
how sad it is when people reach a point where they willingly say, lie to us so we can hear what we want to hear, not what we need to hear. And friends, so many people today have bought into lies just like those. There is so much of a push today for a health and wealth, feel-good gospel. Joel Osteen has preached it across the United States of America, this feel-good, after-dinner, nobody's going to get upset type of speech where everybody is motivated and inspired. And in reality, nobody's pointed toward the sin problem and Jesus as the cure. We need to realize that these feel-good speeches were nothing short of what they were getting in the day of Isaiah, and God condemns those. Don't get me wrong. Is the Bible full of joy and hope and comfort and courage? Sure it is. But when it comes to matters of right and wrong, and when people's souls are hanging in the balance, as they are every day, people need to be told, sin separates a man from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Sin breaks the heart of God. Ezekiel 6, verse 9. The wages of sin is spiritual death. Romans 6, 23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, there is a sin problem, but there is also an answer, and man desperately needs to seek that answer from the Almighty so that he can be saved. You know, one of the great passages in the book of Isaiah that encourages every child of God in the work that he's doing is seen in a picturesque way in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 30 and 31. I want you to listen to these beautiful words of encouragement for the faithful of God. Listen to Isaiah 40 beginning in verse 30. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, God says, and the young men shall utterly fail. But, notice the contrast, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Yes, it's true that some of these people aren't following God. They're going to perish. They're going to be destroyed. But, and here's the contrast, those who wait on the Lord. And the idea is serving God putting God first, giving your life to Him. Those who make that dedication and commitment to God, they're the ones who'll be blessed. The Bible says they'll not faint. Rather, they'll mount up with wings like eagles. The strength, the power, the, 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 the majestic nature of that, and they shall run and not be faint. They shall walk and not be weary. When we think about the power of serving God, Friend, you talk about having your strength renewed. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 4, As children of God, we're transferred out of darkness into light, Colossians 1 13, and we rise up with a renewed zeal and desire every day to serve the Almighty. What a, a beautiful picture. You see the majestic nature of an eagle flying, and you think about the power that made that, and then you think about this. Those who serve God are far greater than the majesty that might be represented in that. We have that renewed strength and zeal when we're putting God first in our lives and striving to serve Him. Another passage that jumps off the pages of the book of Isaiah has to deal with man's purpose, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 7. I want you to notice Isaiah 43, verse number 7. God says, everyone who's called by my name, whom I've created for my glory, God says, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. What's life all about? Why are you here? What's your purpose? Are we just going through life, going through the motions with no real goal in mind or no real purpose? So many people, I think, live life without ever grasping their purpose. What is my purpose for being here? Isaiah said it in Isaiah 43, verse 7. God says, Everyone who's called by my name, if I claim to wear that divine name, that new name, Isaiah 62, 1 and 2, Acts 11, verse 26, the name Christian, everyone who's called by my name, notice this, God says, Whom I created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Why am I here? What's my life all about? 
I was created and so were you to bring honor and glory to the name of God. How do we do that? By the life that we live. Let your light so shine, Jesus said, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 16. Paul said whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. And do you remember that end conclusion, that grand conclusion that Solomon came to in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13? Solomon said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. What's my life about? Fear God. Keep His commandments. That's the, the whole duty or purpose of man. I've not been put here to see how much money I can make. I, I've not been put here to amass land or amass wealth or to live through every luxury and pleasure that God has created that, that's out there. Why am I here? To serve God and to put Him first. And friend, you can't put God first without putting Jesus in your life. Isaiah chapter 53 is where I direct your attention for just a moment. And I want you to notice what the suffering servant did for us so that we could have the hope of heaven. Look in Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4. The Scripture says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now notice this. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Friend, there's no hope in this life for salvation outside of Jesus. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 24, He Himself, speaking of Jesus, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. And then He quotes these words, Through whose stripes we are healed. Through whose wounds we are healed. Have you obeyed the gospel, friend? Have you become a child of God? If not, we urge you to today. Hear God's word. Believe that Jesus is the only way. Believe it so much so that you'll repent and change your life. Luke 13, 3. Make that good confession. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And then Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. If you've not done that, we encourage you to so that you can have the hope and joy of salvation. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. And to God be the glory. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.